This recording is partly for me because I wanted to remember these passages, but also for anybody who thinks that they might want to read some Vygotsky. This is where I would suggest starting in chapter six of Thinking and Speech. And if any of this sounds appealing, then I'd recommend checking out some of the resources that are attached here. They'll give you links to the direct text itself. When I first read Vygotsky's own writing, it was extremely difficult for me. It's still quite challenging to be sure. And even with the help of mentors and discussion groups and video resources on the internet, it was really quite over my head. But I think chapter six is a really nice way to enter into Vygotsky's original sources for anybody that might be interested in pursuing that path. And our first excerpt begins on page 168. The development of scientific concepts begins with the verbal definition. As part of an organized system, this verbal definition descends to the concrete. It descends to the phenomena which the concrete represents. In contrast, the everyday concept tends to develop outside any definite system. It tends to move upward toward abstraction and generalization. The development of the scientific social concept, a phenomenon that occurs as part of the educational process, constitutes a unique form of systematic cooperation between the teacher and child. The maturation of the child's higher mental functions occurs in this cooperative process. That is, it occurs through the adult's assistance and participation. In the domain of interest to us, this is expressed in the growth of the relativeness of causal thinking and in the development of a certain degree of voluntary control in scientific thinking. This element of voluntary control is a product of the instructional process itself. The earlier maturation of scientific concepts is explained by the unique form of cooperation between the child and the adult. That is the central element of the educational process. It is explained by the fact that in this process, knowledge is transferred to the child in a definite system. This is also why the level of development of scientific concepts forms a zone of proximal possibilities for the development of everyday concepts. The scientific concept blazes the trail for the everyday concept. It is a form of preparatory instruction which leads to its development. Thus, at a single stage in the development of a single child, we find differing strengths and weaknesses in scientific and everyday concepts. Our data indicate that the weakness of the everyday concept lies in its incapacity for abstraction, and the child's incapacity to operate it in a voluntary manner. Where volition is required, the everyday concept is generally used incorrectly. In contrast, the weakness of the scientific concept lies in its verbalism and its insufficient saturation with the concrete. This is the basic danger in the development of the scientific concept. The strength of the scientific concept lies in the child's capacity to use it in a voluntary manner, in its readiness for action. This picture begins to change by the fourth grade. The verbalism of the scientific concept begins to disappear as it becomes increasingly more concrete. This has its influence on the development of spontaneous concepts as well. Ultimately, two developmental curves begin to merge. Schiff, 1935. How do scientific concepts develop in the course of school instruction? What is the relationship between instruction, learning, and the processes involved in the internal development of scientific concepts in the child's consciousness? Are these simply two aspects of what is essentially one and the same process? Does the process involved in the internal development of concepts follow instruction? like a shadow follows the object which casts it, not coinciding with it, but reproducing and repeating its movement? Or do both processes exist in a more complex and subtle relationship which requires special investigation? We know from research on concept formation that the concept is not simply a collection of associative connections learned with the aid of memory. We know that the concept is not an automatic mental habit but a complex and true act of thinking that cannot be mastered through simple memorization. The child's thought must be raised to a higher level for the concept to arise in consciousness. At any stage of its development, the concept is an act of generalization. The most important finding of all research in this field 
is that the concept, represented psychologically as word meaning, develops. The essence of the development of the concept lies in the transition from one structure of generalization to another. Any word meaning at any age is a generalization. However, word meaning develops. When the child first learns a new word, the development of its meaning is not completed, but has only begun. From the outset, the word is a generalization of the most elementary type. In accordance with the degree of his development, the child moves from elementary generalizations to higher forms of generalization. This process is completed with the formation of true concepts. The development of concepts or word meanings presupposes the development of a whole series of functions. It presupposes the development of voluntary attention, logical memory, abstraction, comparison, and differentiation. These complex mental processes cannot simply be learned. From a theoretical perspective, then, there's little doubt concerning the inadequacy of the view that the concept is taken by the child in completed form and learned like a mental habit. The inadequacy of this view is equally apparent in connection with practice. No less than experimental research, pedagogical experience demonstrates that direct instruction in concepts is impossible. It is pedagogically fruitless. The teacher who attempts to use this approach achieves nothing but a mindless learning of words, an empty verbalism that simulates or imitates the presence of concepts in the child. Under these conditions, the child learns not the concept, but the word, and this word is taken over by the child through memory rather than thought. Such knowledge turns out to be inadequate in any meaningful application. This mode of instruction is the basic defect of the purely scholastic verbal modes of teaching which have been universally condemned. It substitutes the learning of dead and empty verbal schemes for the mastery of living knowledge. Tolstoy, who had an extraordinary understanding of the nature of the word and its meaning, saw with both clarity and precision the futility of attempting to transmit concepts directly from teacher to student. I'm going to skip these two pages about Tolstoy, although they're very interesting, and I recommend reading them to see where Vygotsky agrees and differs from Tolstoy on this topic, and we'll continue at the bottom of page 171. The path from the child's first encounter with the new concept to the moment when the word and concept are made the child's own is a complex internal mental process. This process includes the gradual development of understanding of the new word, a process that begins with only the vaguest representation. It also includes the child's initial use of the word. His actual mastery of the word is only the final link in this process. We attempted to express what is essentially the same idea in our argument that when the child first learns the meaning of a new word, the process of development has not been completed, but has only begun. Our research in pursuit of the hypothesis stated at the beginning of this chapter shows that the paths through which we can teach concepts to the child are not limited to the thousand to which Tolstoy refers. Conscious instruction of the pupil in new concepts, i.e. new forms of the word, is not only possible but may actually be the source for a higher form of development, the child's own concepts, particularly those that have developed in the child prior to conscious instruction. Our research demonstrates that it is possible to work directly on concepts in school instruction. It also shows, however, that this constitutes not the end, but the beginning of the development of the scientific concept. It does not include the processes of development, but gives them new directions. It places the processes of instruction and development in new and maximally propitious relationships. By differentiating scientific and everyday concepts in this way, we do not resolve the issue of whether this differentiation is objectively justified. Indeed, a basic task of our research is to clarify the issue of whether there is any objective difference between the processes involved in the development of scientific concepts and those involved in the development of other types of concepts. If such a difference does exist, we must clarify its nature. We must also identify objective differences which can provide a foundation for the comparative study of the processes involved in the development of scientific and everyday concepts.
task of this chapter is to show that this distinction is empirically warranted, theoretically justified, and heuristically fruitful. Its task is to show that it must function as the cornerstone of our working hypothesis. We must demonstrate that scientific concepts develop differently than everyday concepts, that the development of these two types of concepts does not follow the same path. Therefore, the task of our experimental research includes acquiring empirical support for the position that there is a difference between the development of scientific and everyday co concepts. It also requires the acquisition of data that will permit us to clarify the precise nature of this difference. We mentioned earlier that there are currently two positions on the issue of how scientific concepts develop in the course of school instruction. As we have pointed out, the first position consists of a complete rejection of any internal development in the emergence of scientific concepts. We have already attempted to point out the inadequacy of this perspective. There is, however, a second position on the issue. This position, currently the more widely accepted of the two, is based on the idea that the development of scientific concepts differs in no essential way from that of the concepts which develop in the course of the child's own experience. This perspective suggests that there is no basis for the differentiation of these developmental processes. From this perspective, the process involved in the development of scientific concepts simply repeats the most basic and essential aspects of the process through which everyday concepts develop. The critical question at this point is whether this second position is well-founded. In the next section, Vygotsky attempts to outline Piaget's approach which is aligned with this second position on the issue. Vygotsky outlines various strengths and some weaknesses in Piaget's approach, according to uh, Vygotsky's perspective, and then responds with a couple short paragraphs in conclusion. This is on page 176. The goal of the present study, the primary motivation, for the construction and experimental verification of our working hypothesis is essentially to overcome these three limitations in what is one of the best contemporary theories of the development of the child's thought. Our first basic assumption is the direct opposite of Piaget's first mistaken thesis. The development of non-spontaneous concepts, particularly scientific concepts, which we consider a high, pure, in both theoretically and practically important type of non-spontaneous concept will manifest all the basic qualitative characteristics of the child's thought at a given stage of development. This position is based on the idea that scientific concepts are not simply acquired or memorized by the child and assimilated by his memory, but arise and are formed through an extraordinary effort of his own thought. This implies that the, that the development of scientific concepts must manifest the characteristics of the child's thought. This assumption is fully supported by our experimental research. Our second assumption is also in opposition to Piaget's. As the purest type of non-spontaneous concept, scientific concepts not only manifest features that are the opposite of those manifested by spontaneous concepts, but manifest features that are identical to those manifested by spontaneous concepts. The boundary that separates these two concepts is fluid. In the actual course of development, it shifts back and forth many times. If we, were, if we are to make some assumption at the outset, it must be the assumption that the development of spontaneous and scientific concepts are closely connected processes that continually influence one another. On the one hand, the development of scientific concepts will depend directly on a particular level of maturation of spontaneous concepts. There is evidence for this in our practical experience. The development of scientific concepts becomes possible only when the child's spontaneous concepts have achieved a certain degree of development. This development is characteristically attained by the beginning of the school age. On the other hand, the emergence of higher types of concepts, example, scientific concepts, will inevitably influence existing spontaneous concepts. These two types of concepts are not encapsulated or isolated in the child's consciousness. They are not separated from one another by an impenetrable wall, nor do they flow in two isolated channels. They interact continually. This will inevitably lead to a situation where generalizations with a comparatively complex structure, such as scientific concepts, elicit changes 
in the structure of spontaneous concepts. Whether we refer to the development of spontaneous concepts or scientific ones, we are dealing with the development of a unified process, concept formation. This developmental process is realized under varying external and internal conditions. By its very nature, however, it remains a unified process. It is not a function of struggle, conflict, and antagonism between two mutually exclusive forms of thinking. Once again, if we do not shy away from the results of the experimental research, we will find that this assumption is fully supported by the data. Finally, in opposition to Piaget's mistaken and contradictory third position, we would argue that in the process of concept formation, the relationship between the processes of instruction and development must be immeasurably more complex and positive in nature than the simple antagonism proposed by Piaget. It is reasonable to anticipate that research will show that instruction is a basic source of the development of the child's concepts and an extremely powerful force in directing this process. This assumption is based on the generally accepted fact that instruction plays a decisive role in determining the entire fate of the child's mental development during the school age, including the development of his concepts. Further scientific concepts can arise in the child's head only on the foundation provided by the lower and more elementary forms of generalization which previously exist. They cannot simply be introduced into the child's consciousness from the outside. Again, this third and final assumption is supported by the research findings. This position on the issue allows us to assess the usefulness of psychological research on the child's concepts for teaching and instruction from a perspective that is very different from Piaget's. As a teacher, I am not a psychologist and I don't have background in that realm. And a lot of the historical references that Vygotsky makes, um, his long reviews of the work of other psychologists and previous traditions can get very confusing at times. Chapter six is, is quite nice because that stuff is handled in a short manner and then it's interspersed throughout the chapter. And mainly he kind of gets right down to business and primarily he's talking about some differences between spontaneous or everyday concepts, the kind that we develop in the sort of normal flow and course of life and a different type of understanding called uh, scientific concepts which are maybe considered systemic concepts, things we learn basically in a more formal setting and concepts that are more abstract and generalized. But I'll let Vygotsky do the talking here.